Every day when I was a kid, I'd drop anything I was doing, no matter what it was, stealing wire, having a fist fight, siphoning gas, no matter what, and I'd tear like a blue streak through the alleys, over fences, under porches, through secret shortcuts to get home, not a second too late for the magic time. My breath rattling in wheezy gasps, sweating profusely from my long cross-country run, Oh, I'd sit glassy-eyed and expectant before our Crosley Notre Dame Cathedral model radio. I was never disappointed. At exactly 5.15, just as dusk was gathering over the picturesque oil refineries and the faint glow of the muttering open hearths was beginning to show red against the gloom, the magic notes of an unforgettable theme, a song came rasping out of our Crosley. Who's that little chatterbox, the one with curly auburn locks? Who do I see? <laughs> it's little orphan Annie. <sighs> they don't write tunes like that anymore. There was one particularly brilliant line that dealt with Sandy, little orphan Annie's Airedale sidekick. Who can forget it? Arf goes Sandy. Arf. I think it was Sandy more than anyone else that drew me to the Little Orphan Annie radio program. Dogs in our neighborhood never went arf, and they certainly were a lot of things, but never faithful. Little Orphan Annie lived in this great place called Tompkins Corners, and there were people called Joe Corntassel, an uncle. They never mentioned the pool room. There were no stockyards or fistfights or drunks sleeping in doorways in good old Tompkins Corners. No way. Orphan Annie and Sandy and Joe Corntassel were always out chasing pirates or trapping smugglers, neither of which we ever had in Indiana, as far as I knew. We had plenty of hubcap stealers, and once even a guy who stole a lawn, but no pirates. At least they didn't call him that. And she also had this great friend named the Asp, who whenever she was really in a tight spot would just show up and Cut everybody's head off. <laughs> oh, I figured if there was anything a kid of seven needed, it was something to have the asp, especially in our neighborhood. He wore a towel around his head. Immediately after the nightly adventure, which usually took place near the headwaters of the dreaded Orinoco River, on would come a guy named Pierre Andre, the definitive radio announcer. Fellas and gals, get set for a meeting of the Little Orphan Annie Secret Circle. Oh, his voice boomed out of the Crosley like some monster, maniacal pipe organ played by the devil himself. Vibrant, urgent, dynamic, commanding. Pierre Andre. I've long had a suspicion that an entire generation of Americans grew up feeling inferior to just the names of the guys on the radio. Pierre Andre. Harlow Wilcox. Vincent Pelletier. Oh, Truman Bradley. Westbrook Van Voorhees, Andre Baruch, Norman Brokenshire. Listen to those names. There wasn't a Charlie Schmidt lap in the lot. Poor little Charlie crouching next to his radio, a born right fielder, playing right field all of his life knee-deep in weeds, waiting for a fly ball that never comes, and more than half afraid that one day they will hit one in his direction. Okay, kids, time to get out your secret decoder pin. Time for another secret message direct from Little Orphan Annie to members of the Little Orphan Annie Secret Circle. I got no pin. A member of an outgroup at the age of seven, and the worst kind of outgroup. I'm living in a non ovaltine drinking neighborhood. All right. Set your pins to B7. 22, 19, 8, 49. Six, thirteen, three, twenty-two, one, four, nineteen. Oh, Pierre Andre could get more out of just numbers than Orson Welles was able to squeeze out of King Lear. Fourteen, nine, thirty-two. Okay, fellas and gals, over and out. And then silence. The show was over, and you had a sinister feeling that out there in the darkness... All over the country there were millions of kids decoding. And all I could do was to go into the kitchen where my mother was cooking supper and knock together a salami sandwich and plot. Somewhere kids were getting the real truth from Orphan Annie, the message. And I had no pin. 
I lived in an oatmeal-eating family and listened to an Ovaltine radio show. To get into the Little Orphan Annie secret circle, you had to send in the silver inner seal from a can of what Pierre Andre called that rich chocolate-flavored drink that all kids love, just like a malted milk that you make at home. <laughs> I had never even seen an Ovaltine can in my life. But as the old truism goes, every man has his chance. And when yours comes, you better grab it. They do not make appointments for the next day. One day, while I'm foraging my way home from school, coming down one of my favorite alleys, knee-deep in garbage and the thrown-out effluvia of kitchen life, there occurred an incident which forever changed my outlook on existence forever. At the time, of course, I was not aware of it, believing instead that I had struck the jackpot and was at last on my way to the big time. There was a standard game played solo by almost every male kid I ever heard of, at least in our neighborhood. It was simple, yet highly satisfying. There were no rules except those which the player improvised as he went along. The game had no name and is as probably as old as creation itself. It consisted of kicking a tin can or tin cans all the way home. The game is not to be confused with a more formal athletic contest called Kick the Can, which did have rules and even teams. This kicking game was a solitary, dogged contest of kid against can, and it is quite possible the very earliest manifestation of the golf syndrome. Anyway, I'm kicking condensed milk cans, usually pet milk baked bean cans, sardine cans along the alley, occasionally changing cans at full gallop when I suddenly found myself kicking a can of a totally unknown nature. I kicked it twice, good solid running belts, before I discovered that what I was kicking was an Ovaltine can, the first that I had ever seen. Instantly I picked it up, astounded by the mere presence of an Ovaltine drinker in our neighborhood and then discovered that they had not only thrown out the Ovaltine can, but had left the silver inner seal inside. Some rich family had thrown it all away. <sighs> Five minutes later, I got this inner seal in the mail. Oh, and I start to wait. Every day I would rush home from school and ask, Is there any mail for me? Day after day, eon after eon waiting for three weeks for something to come in the mail to a kid is like being asked to build a pyramid single-handed using the number three erector set, the one without the motor. We never did get much mail around our house anyway. Usually it was bad news when it did come. Once in a while a letter marked Occupant arrived, offering my old man $300 on a signature only, no questions asked. Even your employer will not be notified. They began with, Friend, are you in money troubles? My old man never could figure out how they knew, especially when they just called him occupant. Day after day, I watched our mailbox. On Saturdays, when there was no school, I would sit on the front porch waiting for the mailman and the sound of the yelping pack of dogs that chased him on his appointed rounds through our neighborhood, his muffled curses and thumping kicks mingling nicely with the steady uproar of snarling and yelping. One thing I knew, trust the old Sandy never chased a mailman, and if he had, he'd have caught him, I'll tell you. Everything comes to he who waits, I guess. At last, after at least 200 years of constant vigil, there was delivered to me a big, fat, lumpy letter. Oh, boy, there are few things more thrilling in life than lumpy letters that rattle. Even to this day, I feel a wild surge of excitement when I run my hands over an envelope that is thick, fat, and pregnant with mystery. I ripped it open, and there it was, my simulated gold plastic decoder pin with knob and my membership card. It was an important moment. Here was a real milestone, and I knew it. I was taking my first step up that great ladder of becoming a real American. Nothing is as important to an American as a membership card with a seal. I know guys who have long strings of them, plastic enclosed, credit cards, membership cards, ID cards, Blue Cross cards, driver's licenses, all strung together in a chain of love. The longer the chain, the more they feel they belong. Here was my first card. 
I was on my way. And the best of all possible ways, I was making it as a phony, a non-Ovaltine drinking official member. Be it known to all and sundry that Mr. Ralph Wesley Parker is hereby appointed a member of the Little Orphan Annie Secret Circle and is entitled to all the honors and benefits accruing thereto. <laughs> Signed, Little Orphan Annie. Countersigned, Pierre Andre, in ink. Oh, boy. Honors and benefits already at the age of seven. I am Mr. Parker. They hardly ever even call my old man that. That night, I can hardly wait until the adventure is over. I want to get to the real thing, the message. That's what counts. I had spent the entire day sharpening pencils, practicing twirling the knob on my plastic simulated gold decoder pin. I had lined up plenty of paper, and I was already at the radio by 3.30, waiting impatiently through the drone of the late afternoon soap operas and newscasts, waiting for my direct contact with Tompkins Corners, my first night as a real member. As 5.15 neared, my excitement mounted. Running waves of goose pimples rippled up and down my spine as I hunched next to our hand-carved seven-tube cathedral in the living room. A pause. A station break. Boom, boom, boom. Who's that little chatterbox? The one with curly golden locks. Who do I see? It's little orphan Eddie. La, da, 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 da. Let's get on with it. I don't need all this jazz about smugglers and pirates. I sat through St Sandy's stupid arfing and little orphan Annie's perils, hardly hearing a word. On comes at long last my friend old Pierre. He's one of my friends now. I am in. It's my first secret meeting. Okay, fellas and gals, get out your decoder pen. Time for the secret message for all the regular pals of Little Orphan Annie, members of the Little Orphan Annie Secret Circle. All set? Here we go. Set your pins at B-12. My eyes narrowed to mere slits, my steely claws working with precision. I set my simulated gold plastic decoder pin to B-12. All ready? Pencils set. Oh, Pierre was in great voice tonight. I could tell that tonight's message was really important just by the sound of his voice. Seven, twenty-two, thirteen, nineteen, eight. I struggled furiously to keep up with his booming voice, dripping with tension and excitement. Finally, okay, kids, that's tonight's secret message. Listen again tomorrow night when you hear... Who is that little chatterbox? The one with curly golden locks. <sighs> Ninety seconds later, I'm in the only room in the house where a boy of seven could sit in privacy and decode. My pin on one knee, my Indian chief tablet on the other, I'm starting to decode my first secret message from Annie herself. Seven. I spun the dial, poring over the plastic scale of letters. Aha! B. It's the letter B. I carefully wrote down my first decoded letter. I went to the next. Twenty-two. Again, I spun the dial. E. <laughs> That's the first word. B E B. For crying out loud, it's a word. Thirteen. S. It was coming easier now. Nineteen. U. From somewhere out in the house, I could hear my kid brother whimpering, his wail gathering steam, and then a faint shriek of my mother. Hurry up! Randy's got to go. Oh, now what? I'll be right out, Ma. Gee whiz, I shouted, hoarsely, sweat dripping off my nose. S-U-15. R-S-U-R-E. Sure. Be sure. The message was coming through. Excitement gripped my gut. I was getting the word from Annie herself. Oh, be sure. Fourteen. Eight. T-O. Be sure to... What? What? What was little orphan Annie trying to say? Seventeen, nine, D-R, sixteen, twelve, one. Ah, uh, be sure to D-R-I, nine, N, K, thirty-two, O-V, nineteen, L-T. I sat for a long moment in that steamy room, staring down at my Indian chief notebook. <sighs> be sure to drink all the tea. A crummy, rotten son of a bitch of a commercial. 
Again, a rising high note from my kid brother. I'll be right out, Ma, for crying out loud. I pulled up my corduroy knickers and went out to face the meatloaf and the red cabbage. The asp had decapitated another victim.